Mm -hmm. um, Julius Abiola, the president of Christ Life Ministries and the presiding bishop of Christ Life Bible Church with uh, its headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, and branches in the other parts of New York, in Far Rockaway, in uh, Bronx, New Jersey, in the state of Maryland, as well as uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have an impact in Antigua, we have an impact in Montserrat, all along the Caribbean uh, seas. We also have our impact in Spain, in, uh, uh, in the UK, in Africa, specifically Nigeria, Liberia, and we have also ministered in India. We have ministered in uh, uh, so many other parts of the world. Now, about Christ Life Ministries, the church is just a branch of Christ Life Ministries. We have a training hub with a mandate to raise up leaders for the end time move of God across the globe. And this one we do through our Bible Institute and seminary, which trains leaders across the globe. We also have our impact in missions in all these countries that I've spoken about. I'm happily married to my heartthrob, uh, Matilda, who is our senior pastor in the ministry. She's a physical therapist by profession, and she's a woman who loves the Lord. She's a preacher as well. And we are blessed with a 10-year-old daughter. Her name is Joy Abiola, who, is, who will believe that one day she will also be involved in ministry. We thank God for what the Lord has done with our ministry in the past 20 years. And we know that the best is still around the corner. Uh, the biblical definition of marriage and family can be found in Genesis chapter 1, where the scriptures declare that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and both of them shall become one flesh. I see it as man living, I see him as cleaving to his wife, and I see the two of them weaving along. It has to do with uh, a man and his wife, a man and a woman. It is not a man and a man. Neither is it a woman as an a woman. It is not between Adam and Steve. It is between Adam and Eve. There is no amount of political correctness, political philosophy that can make God to change his mind. That is marriage. That is the way God made it, and that is the way it is. But with the family, the second part of the question, with the family, the family includes the parents of the, f or, or the which consists of the man and his wife and the children. And I want to add any, one other thing. Every other person that lives under your roof, they are part of your family. The other day when the Lord was speaking concerning uh, Abraham, he said, I know him. He will command his household after him. And that involves everything. If you look at the book of uh, Exodus, for example, it talks about you must serve God, you and your household, and so on and so forth. So when we talk about the family, it includes also the, I mean, every member of the household. Now, the marriage relationship, we should understand that it is a spiritual thing because God created marriage. It was an institution that God made. Uh, the marriage is, number one, God will not joke with it. Number two, the church, he will not joke with it. He said, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's, let's come to marriage. Marriage is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual operation, and God actually is interested in marriage. So, such as, I mean, the way uh, the fish of the sea cannot exist outside the sea, because when God wanted to create the fishes, he spoke to the sea. He spoke to the waters. And the same way, man cannot exist in marriage relationship without the one who made the marriage relationship. Bringing God into marriage relationship or allowing God to work with us 
in a marriage relationship is so crucial. We cannot overemphasize it. We cannot underemphasize it. It's so crucial. And we need to actually take it from there. Bring God into it. Marriage without God is like something that is crashing before we even uh, begin to, be, be, before we start it uh, at all. So I believe that the spiritual aspect of marriage is so crucial. And to be successful in marriage, we need God. Uh, well, a Christ-centered home is a home where Christ is not just a guest. I've been to homes where I will see something like uh, uh, Christ is the head of this home, uh, somebody who comes in at every, uh, every meal, that and that. I've seen things like that. It's not just somebody who comes in to us when we are eating. As a matter of fact, is the one that is in charge of the home. Life is too delicate to run it on your own. Marriage is too important for us to run on our own. Now, there is a song we used to sing in Sunday school in those days. It says, if Jesus is in, the, is in the family, happy, happy home, happy, happy home. It, it's, it's true. It's true. I have been married for 25 years, and we are still counting by the grace of God. The whole thing about the success of our marriage is God. The fact that we are not running it alone Jesus is the only qualified third party in our marriage relationship. Men will fail you because they are sentimental, because their knowledge is limited. But Jesus knew you. He is the pillar, the foundation of the relationship. He comes as the bedrock of every whole marriage relationship. So bringing him in there or allowing him. And the funny thing is, I use the word allowed right there because... It will not force anybody into anything. He will is is a is a is a, is a gentleman. He knocks the door of every heart. If a man will open and we allow him to come in, he will come in. But if we shut him out, Jesus will not do anything because man is uh, a, 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 a God gave us a will. So Jesus being in our home is so important, and that is the only one who can sustain the home. The only one who can take care of the crisis. A crisis are imminent. Trials are there. But when we fly upon the wings of the Messiah, it becomes easier for us. When challenges come, the only one who can answer to them is the Lord Jesus Christ. Men will fail us. We will fail one another at one point or the other. But the only one who can sustain us is Christ Jesus. And that is why it has to be in the center not just inviting him to come into the home when there is problem. Call upon me, I will answer thee. Don't we should not just make Jesus uh, a prayer contractor when the trouble comes. Uh, we should actually have him there. The psalmist says something, and that's one of my favorite scriptures. In Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5, he said, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that one thing, I will seek after. That talks about his priority in life. One thing I've desired, one thing I will seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to inquire in his temple. So that it will not just be in the day of trouble I'll be running around, but it's in the day of trouble, uh, the Lord will hide me in his pavilion. Let's get him on board, and let's get on board with him in our marriage relationship, and it makes a whole lot of difference. Now, uh, leading my family, let's talk about leading my family. Number one, I didn't marry outside Christianity. There is a need for the whole family to heed from the same spiritual part. Uh, I believe in that. I don't believe in uh, cross, uh, uh, marrying across uh, uh, religious lines. I don't believe in it. Personally, my wife is a Christian. We, we, we got married as Christians. Did we have our challenges? Do we still have challenges? We do. But the thing is this, from the onset, because of our value system, we kept the value system. Now, leading the family into Christianity is another thing. I'm talking about my immediate family. We are blessed with a daughter, 10-year-old daughter, 
now and we thank God for that. We get her involved in church. One thing, mistake that many people make these days is that they actually get their children, they leave them at home. We don't leave our child at home. We get her involved in church. And we, make her to know, we have made her to know something, that if we are so interested in things that pertain to you, your education, your things that you do, your extracurricular activities, then you have to be fully involved in church. I think the earlier that one started, the better. We don't wait until the children are grown up before we begin to get them in the air. And we don't leave our own daughter at home when we are in church, say, okay, do your own work, we will join you later. In most cases, children are on the internet when you are home. We get them involved, we teach our daughter to pray, we teach our daughter to seek the face of the Lord. She gets involved in fasting with us when we need to fast. She gets in church, I mean, into Bible study with us. We wake her up for family devotion, 6.30 a.m. We get her involved in it. We make her to know that the primary thing in life is to serve God. And no matter what you do, whether you are in school or one thing or the other, apart from being a representative or an ambassador of this family, you are God's ambassador wherever you are. I think that has helped our daughter a great deal. And another thing is that all the people who stay with us in our house under our roof, we make it a point of importance. There was a time a Muslim boy was living in my house. Uh, I didn't have a problem with that. Uh, one thing is that I make sure he comes to church. That is the standard. And from the onset, if you don't come with me to church, then you have no part being a part of this family. So that it is necessary for all the members of the family to hit from the same spiritual part. And that will help them to keep up with the things of God. Life is too dangerous for one to run alone. With the church, uh, coming to talk about the church, we have uh, spoken about the family. Let's talk about the church. Now, with the church, church is a body of believers. I read uh, something yesterday, a book yesterday that uh, got my attention. He said, don't just go to church. He said, don't go to church. That was bold. He said, be a part of the church. Uh, the way we led our church is getting people involved in ministry. Christ Life Ministries is not Julius Abiola Ministry. Uh, Christ Life Ministries, we make our people to understand that uh, in this ministry, we provide a platform for people to actually uh, go from, I mean, to, to operate their ministries. I uh, found out that in the 21st night, I mean 20th and 21st century, one thing is so uh, one thing that happened to the church, which was uh, a disservice to church, is the fact or to the body of Christ, is the fact that we exalted the pastoral office at the expense of uh, all the other offices in church, and so people are not fulfilled. It's only people who are pastors who are fulfilled, and so in this ministry we offer a platform for people to operate their giftings at the different levels so that if God is calling you to be a teacher of the word, we provide a way for your ministry to be seen and to be relevant in the church. And we do this through also through teachings. We teach our people. Uh, by the grace of God, our ministry is a, is a word-based church. We teach our people. We show them the way of the Lord from the scriptures. And uh, I think we are doing fine. We are also uh, a church that believe in the family. And so in our church, somebody gave this testimony some times ago. He said, uh, well, until he came here, he didn't, she did, until she came here, she never knew how uh, to get the, the families go to church together. In this place, we encourage the men to lead their wives and their children to church. And this has helped us a great deal. And also, uh, we, lead, we in the leadership, we lead by example. We lead by example. We don't tell people to do things if we are not doing them. And that has helped our people a great deal. By the grace of God, we 
have people who have uh, been part of our ministry uh, in the past 20 years. We'll be celebrating 20 years of ministry in New York uh, within the next uh, four or five months. And we have people scattered all over who are product of these ministries, who are doing so wonderfully well wherever they are. Uh, I, yeah, somebody once told me something. He said that uh, you know a tree by its fruit. And our fruits that people have tasted outside, they attest to the fact that we are a ministry that believes in, um, uh, in the Christian values, and we have taught our people to do that. So we do it by training, not just by training. We do it by living it, not just by living it. We do it by teaching our people. That suggests to me that um, having your spouse to forgive you means that you have done something against your spouse. Uh, my relationship is a very, very serious thing. Uh, we do things uh, uh, against the relationship from time to time. I think the first aspect, of, I mean the first step in asking for forgiveness is for us to actually know that what we have done is wrong. Uh, in most cases, there are so many things that tell on marriage relationships. Number one, culture tells on marriage relationship. For example, if you are from my background, uh, where they believe that the man is the, uh, the, the boss of everything next to God in the marriage relationship and he can behave and misbehave, uh, people will uh, I, I, there are men who will take an advantage of the culture and decide to uh, say, well, nobody can query me. Now, nobody can query you. But when a man fears God, you know when you are wrong. Now, there is something about the New Testament, and we need to go into this. Uh, the, 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 with the New Testament, the Bible says that he will write the laws on the tables of our heart. When you are doing something that is wrong, you know. Number two thing is that Knowing that something is wrong enough does not mean that you will be forgiven. Now, we need to ask for forgiveness to be forgiven. Now, we need to come clean to our spouses. Ah, every man is tempted. We go through different kinds of temptation. One thing we can do is that because it takes time to build trust, we need to also know that it takes time to heal when we default. And so we need to be open. We need to uh, know what we have done is wrong. We need to uh, actually verbalize it. Let our spouses or your, let your spouse know that you know that what you have done is wrong. And like anything when it comes to forgiveness, we need to desist from future occurrences. And those are the things, practical things we can do to make our spouses to forgive us. Now, one, uh, there is something we, we talk about here. Uh, whatever your level of ministry, type of ministry, you cannot take people to where you have not been to. Now, to make our children to understand who God is. We also need to know who God is. Uh, for us to actually lead our children, you cannot lead your children to where you have not been to. If you don't know the Lord, you cannot teach your children to know the Lord. Get them involved in what you are doing. Let them know that you love the Lord. Let them know that the Lord occupies the first place in your heart. Let them know. Let it be apparent. Let it be so obvious to them. Let them know it. Let them, let them be, I mean, if they should get to a point where they will be able to preempt what daddy is doing, where daddy is, how daddy loves the Lord. And uh, to get your children to love the Lord is a very serious task, very important. But they will not love the Lord the way you love. They, they, they cannot go beyond loving the Lord more than the way you love God and the precepts you set for them. Uh, the other thing is, 
making them or helping them to identify their ministry. A, a, helping them to identify their ministry. Last week, something happened in our home last week. Uh, my daughter came up and she said she needed some of the uh, publicity things in church. And she needed to send them out, uh, cards, invitation cards to her friends, their families, uh, even the school principal. I initially, I laughed. And I said, you go to the, the school principal. She said, I will go to the school principal. What do you want to tell the school principal? I will give her the card for the upcoming convention. And I will request that she paste it on the notice board of the school. I was shocked. And I said, okay, I will encourage her. So I got her the cards. I said, take it to the principal. Even if the principal will not put it there, she will be glad and satisfied that she had done something. So I started talking. The day. One of the uh, friend's mothers, were, one of them was around uh, with us in the car. We met at the school. And as we were talking, she said, I have noticed something about Joy. Joy likes sharing about the church, about God with other children in the class. And that woman said, have you noticed that she's, I mean, that that is her calling? For the first time, it dawned on me that somebody from outside could identify what my daughter's calling was. And it is by allowing her, keeping her, or bringing her into what we do in church. She knows we love the Lord, and she sees it as a part of her nature to love God. We are involved in ministry, and she sees it as our duty to be involved in ministry. I think above all, there are three things we pray about in this church. We pray for our children, that godliness will become their nature. Holiness will become their culture, and righteousness will become their lifestyle. Three things. And we make the children also to know it. I will make our own daughter to know it. I know some other families in the church make their children to know that. That godliness will become their nature. Holiness will become their culture. And righteousness will become their lifestyle. Uh, and also, we keep our children in prayers. And that will help them a great deal. I was sharing with uh, my associate pastor, my right-hand man, the executive pastor of our church, earlier around today, about something that had been on my mind, especially after um, reading an article written by Lee Grady, about five things about uh, the prosperity gospel that hurt the church in Africa. I read it and I cried. I developed a burden about it, which actually supports something that I'd had in mind over the years. Um, my priority today is to teach people to serve the Lord and to please Him. To serve the Lord and to please Him. That has been my priority. That is my, that is my message. That is what I take everywhere I go. Now, does God want us to be rich? Yes. Yes. Does God want us to prosper? Yes. But taking the thing to the level of greed is not part of God's agenda for his church. I know that people do everything today to be rich. Uh, people do every corny things to be rich. But we need to reevaluate God's move. We need to uh, reevaluate our workings within the, the, the scope of God's will and things that give God pleasure as a body. Because if we are not careful, uh, the, the motives of our people are changing. The church is changing. The paradigm is changing. The paradigm is shifting so fast. Uh, people do things these days, not because they want to please the Lord, but actually because they want to, uh, they, they, because of what they will gain out of it. Uh, but 
That is not what we are called to do. Jesus Christ came, the Bible says he came for two things. The Bible says he came to serve and to save that which was lost. Now, did he need money in his ministry? Yes. He made all things. Was he a poor man? The Bible says he became poor so that we might be rich. That doesn't mean that he's calling us into poverty. But as we come to the realization of the will of God concerning our lives, he said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. It's not only about physical poverty, but poverty in spirit actually has to do with having a realization of who God is and our inability without God. I think the church needs to have a, para a paradigm shift back to basics. We need to go back to basics. We need to go back to discipleship. We need to go back to pleasing the Lord and serving Him. That is my heart desire. And two days ago, I was just thinking about this. And in my heart, I said, Julius, what will you want on your tombstone when the time comes and you are gone? And I concluded, here lies a Christian who served the Lord in his generation with one soul thing in his heart to, pee, to please his maker. And that has been my, that has been in my heart. That is my message. And I pray that the Lord will grant me the grace to push through. Thank you.